Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be in God's house again. It's good to be able to fellowship here with all of you as a family of God, as we worship together. Uh, Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father, we do give thanks for this day that you've given to us, a day when we can draw aside and focus our hearts and minds more fully on you. Father, we know that this is something we ought to be doing every day, but this day is special because you have set it aside. And so we ask that you might help us to look to you, to look to you as you seek to teach us, instruct us, as you seek to speak to us through your word. Lord, may what we do here this morning truly be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now, I'm assuming that you all know what season of the year begins this week. Lent. Obviously, I'm not talking about the weather. I don't know what season we're in when it comes to the weather lately. Uh, But as far as the Christian calendar goes, the season of Lent begins this Wednesday. Now, I realize as Baptists, we generally don't pay a great deal of attention to the church calendar, other than Easter and Christmas, that is. Uh, and we don't emphasize the concept of Lent. There are a variety of reasons for that, obviously. Partly, it's in reaction to the ritualism of much of the organized church in the past, Uh, Partly it's because the sense of legalism that all too often is brought into the observance of Lent and partly because we don't really understand the importance of it, what it's all about. And we don't quite know what to do with it. Uh, Well, whether it's any of these reasons or whatever or all of them, the point is generally we don't deal with it very much. But in the process, I wonder if we may not have lost something worthwhile. Specifically, I wonder whether we may not have lost the sense of spiritual discipline which originally undergirded the observance of these days. Uh, to understand what I'm talking about, I think we first have to understand the original purpose of Lent. Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter, including that last week, the Passion Week, was meant to be a time of preparation. A time of preparation so that we might better understand and appreciate what Good Friday and the cross and the suffering and death of Christ is all about. And more important, of what that should mean for us as individuals in our Christian walk. Lent was meant to be a time where through the exercise of spiritual discipline, we would, in a sense, enter more fully into what Jesus did for us and that we would come to appreciate it with a fuller depth of meaning. Now, let's face it, today, for the most part and for most people, much of that has been totally lost. And so Lent has become at best meaningless, and at worst, misused and abused. And so, in a sense, I think we may be justified in just forgetting about it. But as I said, in the process, 
I wonder whether we haven't lost something extremely worthwhile. That sense of spiritual discipline which originally undergirded the observance of these days. Now when I'm talking about the sense of spiritual discipline, what I mean is a willingness and a desire to make a direct vow to God. And then in his strength, seeking to carry out that vow in our lives. You know, if you look at many of the great men and women in the Bible, you will find that very often they were directed by vows, by promises, by covenants that they had made to God. For example, in the Old Testament, you've got a group of people known as the Nazarites. Uh, They were not people who came from Nazareth. (laughs) Don't confuse the, the names. Nazarites. But they were individuals who were under a special vow to God, vows that they had taken upon themselves. In fact, there's a whole series of regulations that dealt with them. If you want to look it up, it's Numbers chapter 6 beginning of that chapter. Uh, Samson, you know him? He was a Nazarite. He was under a vow to God. And they weren't alone in this. For example, we read about Jacob, one of the patriarchs, who, it is said, made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, then shall the Lord be my God, and this shall be God's house. He made a vow to God, and he sought to keep that vow. Uh, We've got the example of Hannah. Uh, She was the mother of Samuel, you know, the great prophet who anointed the first kings of Israel. Well, she had been childless, And she came to the Lord pleading for a child. And we read, and she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And the psalmists certainly were not adverse to taking vows. Psalm 56, I'm under vows to you, O God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Or Psalm 76, make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Or again, Psalm, Psalm 66, I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you, vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. And even the Apostle Paul isn't left out of this. He didn't hesitate to take vows upon himself. If you turn to Acts 8, chapter, verse 18, you read, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. So let me suggest this morning that if you want this coming Good Friday and Easter season to be a time of personal renewal for you, if you want to use this time to gain renewed spiritual strength, it might not hurt for you to consider following example of such men and women as I just talked about. I don't think you can go wrong if you make this period before Easter, whether you want to observe Lent or not, I don't care, but that you take this time before Easter and make it a time of preparation for yourself in that you do take upon yourself certain vows and then with God's help proceed to keep them. Now, I realize that most people in keeping Lent take up vows of denial. They give up something. 
they do without. I know one lady who's going to give up Facebook for Lent. <laughs> but that's a common type of thing. Well, I would suggest that instead of making a vow of denial, that you do the opposite. Instead of taking something away, add something to your life. Something along the lines of that scripture passage that we just read. Add on and add on and add on. And the reason I suggest that is because in our spiritual walk, often there are things we need but don't obtain unless we make a special effort to attain them. And I'm convinced that the vows that I'm going to suggest to you this morning may help us do exactly that. So, vow number one. May I suggest that the first vow you should take upon yourself during this time before Easter is that you deal thoroughly with the sin in your life. You know, the more I look around at what's going on, the more I'm convinced that our society is trying to drive the whole concept of sin underground. They're trying to get rid of it. They've come up with all sorts of attempts to explain it away, give it new names, a new face. More than anything, they just want to ignore the whole idea as though it didn't exist. You know, if you listen to our so-called educated social scientists, uh, there are all sorts of personality issues uh, that are blamed on what they call a guilt complex. Instead of confessing your shortcomings and failures and sins, you're told to go to a professional where you lie down on a couch and tell him all about yourself. And the end result... Uh, we're told that maybe we were deeply disappointed when we were two years old or our parents' toilet trained us in an inappropriate manner or our personality development was stifled because somebody said no to us when we were a little kid or maybe we've been offended by somebody or you name it. And all of that is supposed to make us feel better because... If we realize that, then we realize that it's not our fault. It's not our fault. Our parents are to blame. The environment's to blame. Other people are to blame. The government's to blame. We're not guilty of anything. We simply had a guilt complex. All reminds me of the cartoon of a man on the psychiatrist's couch and the doctor looks at the man and says, I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but you don't have a guilt complex. You actually are guilty. Well, that actually hits it right on the head. The problem is not a guilt complex. The problem is guilt. And we're all guilty. You know it. I know it. We're all guilty. Because we are all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin is still the ancient enemy of the soul. It always was. It always will be. It never changes. Uh, one of the great preachers of a past generation, uh, Dr. William Wilbur Chapman, he used to tell about a fellow pastor who often spoke on the subject of sin. And he didn't hesitate to name the sins. He was very specific in his preaching, in his language. He minced no words, very outspoken in his language. And one of the church leaders, once they came to him and urged him to tone down his language a little bit, was too explicit. He told them, we wish you wouldn't speak so plainly about these sins. Our young people hearing you will be more likely to indulge in these sins. Call it something else. Call it inhibition, error, mistake, even a twist of nature. 
And Pastor looked at him and said, Oh, I understand what you're talking about. He went over to his desk and got out a little bottle that was marked with a skull and crossbones. And he looked, showed it to the guy and said, This bottle contains arsenic. Notice the red label that reads poison? What you want me to do is change the label and paste something like wintergreen over it. The more harmless the name, the more dangerous the dose is going to be. So renaming sin doesn't lessen its consequences. Ignoring it doesn't make it disappear. And therefore, it's imperative that we deal with it and that we deal with it thoroughly. Remember what Paul said? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness. That's what lies at the door of the kingdom of God. And the soul that sins, it shall die. That means that every known sin needs to be named and identified and repudiated and confessed. And then we've got to trust God to cleanse us from it and to deliver us from it. We dare not allow any conscious, deliberate sin to have free reign in our lives. And I said it before, I'll say it many more times. It's not enough to simply offer up a blanket statement, forgive my sins. You've got to take the time to search your lives honestly so that you can actually stop excusing what you've been doing. Stop trying to cover up the things that are wrong or shift the blame. If you're envious... Call it envy. Recognize it for what it is. If you tend towards self-pity, don't feel appreciated, acknowledge that for what it is, pride. If you're resentful, admit it. You know, there's some people who live in a state of sputtering indignation, uh, like a hen that's been thrown out of its nest constantly running in all directions, always complaining about someone doing them wrong somewhere. Well, if you've got that kind of a spirit, then you need to deal with it. Let God get it out of you. Or maybe your problem is temper. Please don't call it righteous indig indignation. We love to do that. We want to claim to be justified. But if your problem is temper, don't give it a new name. And don't blame it on others. It's not other people who make you angry. No, you get angry. Because if you have a temper, either you get rid of it, or it will get rid of much of your spiritual vitality and power. Never forget, God is holy and sin cannot abide in his presence. And therefore, if there is sin in our lives, how can we abide in his presence? Second, another vow that I believe will go a long way in increasing your spiritual vitality is vow to never own anything. You remember that rich young ruler who came up to Jesus and asked him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life? And how Jesus first asked him about keeping the commandments. And then finally Jesus said to him, you lack one thing. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And we're told that the young man turned away sad because he had many possessions. Or I like the way one translation puts it, he owned a lot of things. What had happened in this young man's life was that the things he owned had gotten such a hold on him that in reality they owned him. 
They controlled him. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across to this young man. That's what he wanted him to realize. In his ministry, Jesus never insisted that we couldn't have things in our hands. What he did was he insisted on our need to be delivered from that sense of possessing these things. This kind of a sense of possession is what holds us back. Now, I read somewhere that most babies are born with their fists clenched. Now, I don't know about that, to be honest with you. But what I do know is that usually one of the earliest words a child speaks is the word mine, as it's holding on to something, right? Well, we tend to keep that sense of mine even when we grow up. We want to hold on to things, the things in our possession. We want, don't want to let go. And unless we overcome that, we will never experience the real freedom and liberty that Christ offers us. Uh, you may have heard what is said to be a good trap for catching monkeys. You take a coconut or a gourd or something like that, something you can hollow out on the inside, and you cut a hole in it just large enough for a monkey to put an empty hand in. And then you put the food or some sparkly trinket or something inside and tie that gourd to the tree. And the monkey is going to want to get what's inside. And it's easy to get a hand in a small hole when you have nothing in it. Ladies, you know how it works with bracelets? Mm -hmm. So the monkey reaches in, grabs, and holds on. Whereas the empty hand passes easily through the hole, a hand holding something doesn't get fit, fit, come back out. As a result, the monkey's stuck. He doesn't realize that all he has to do is let go of what he's holding on to. But because he continues to hold on, he's caught, he's captured. That's the end of it. Well, our sense of possession, ownership, our sense of mind does the same thing. It robs us of our freedom to fully serve God and Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we've got to give up everything, that we've got to give it away to charity or even the church. Uh, there may be some individuals of who, whom God asks that, but they're few and far between. For most of us, God lets us have our car and our home and our business and our bank account and maybe even that big entertainment center we've wanted, whatever. God isn't a sports board. He lets us have a lot of things, provided we understand that they're not really ours. God simply has lent them for our use. And therefore, I suggest that you make a vow to give up your sense of ownership. Because the reality is, nothing belongs to us. It all belongs to him. And then there's a third vow I challenge you to make. Never look for any glory. God alone is God. God alone is responsible for all that there is. And it is therefore to him that all glory is due. As I talked about last week, he is worthy, not us. And there's no reason in the world why he should be expected to share that glory with anybody else especially us. Now, we've got a problem with that. Because of our sinful nature, it's natural for us to hope that what we do, somehow or other, is going to get recognized. That some 
one in some way will take notice of us. And that's true not just in terms of what we do in private or on the job. It's also true when it comes to our Christian service. Oh, there's no question that our desire is to serve the Lord. We look for opportunities to make use of our God-given talents and abilities. But more often than not, we also want others to know that we are the ones doing it. We want them to appreciate how much we are doing for the Lord. Now, we may not be ready to admit it, but if we're really honest, we've probably all had moments when we were a little bit like that Pharisee in the temple who was praying there that Jesus talked about. Remember how he pointed out to God all of the good things he had been doing for God? Same way, we want to serve the Lord. But we also want others to know we're serving the Lord. Someone put it this way, we are seeking a reputation among the saints. That, however, is dangerous ground. It's bad enough to seek a reputation in the world. When we seek it among the saints, it can be deadly. Our Lord gave up his reputation for our sake. Never forget that. Are we greater than he is? Uh, Meister Eckhart one of the great biblical scholars and teachers of the Middle Ages, once preached a sermon that dealt with the time that Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple. And in that sermon, he said this, Now, there was nothing wrong with those men buying and selling there. There was nothing wrong with exchanging money there. It had to be done. The sin lay in their doing it for profit they got a percentage on serving the Lord. And then he drew this following conclusion. Anybody who serves for a commission, for what little bit of glory he can get out of it, is a merchant and ought to be cast out of the temple. Now, I don't like that. But it's true. He hit it right on the head. If we're serving the Lord and yet slyly hoping to get a little 5% commission of glory, look out. It's going to chill the power of God in your spirit. We've got to determine never to take any glory, but see to it that God gets it all. So here's my suggestion for you three spiritual vows that I'm convinced are going to add power to your life. Vow to deal thoroughly with the sin in your life. Vow never to own anything. And vow never to seek any glory. They sound simple enough, but they're anything but. Because if you take these vows seriously, you're going to find out very quickly that they cut against everything in our old nature. You might say they introduce a cross into our lives. Because they strike at the very heart of our self-life. But isn't that exactly what Jesus asks of us? When he says, take up your cross and follow me. And in doing that, he is asking nothing more of us than what he has already done for us. He committed all he had, all he was, and he took a cross upon himself. And that cross wasn't even his. It was ours. It was ours. And yet he took it upon himself in order to save us 
to help us, to forgive us. So what are you going to do in return? Maybe what you can do today is make these vows to God. And then in his power, because you can't do it by yourself, in his power, endeavor to carry them out in your life. And I'm convinced that it will not only bring you closer to God, but it will give you renewed spiritual power, and I'm convinced it will bring revival to your heart. Let's pray. Father, you have given your all for us. You gave up your reputation. You took upon yourself a cross, our cross, so that we might be reconciled to you, so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be reborn. Father, Help us to make a response to what you have done today by taking upon ourselves a cross as well to deal thoroughly with our sin, to never own anything, and to give all glory, all glory, 